from car crashes and the handling of high voltage battery packs that have sustained physical trauma requires extra care and caution given the increased likelihood that they would either undergo thermal runaway or if they're already undergoing thermal runaway how first responders and emergency services are able to able to be trained and equipped to deal with this sort of new hazard that's uh, on the road. As well, uh, you need to be making sure that the technicians and employees that are handling these batteries during the dismantling phase that we talked about earlier are certified with respect to handling high voltage uh, equipment and as well that they're properly trained uh, to take the safety precautions necessary to mitigate the health and safety risk associated with dealing with these batteries when you're dismantling them into the modular components for recycling. And then finally, just talking about the environmental risk as a whole, if we don't build out the global infrastructure required to recycle these batteries, then the improper disposal of these batteries in the future at increasing rates will lead to environmental contamination as uh, heavy metals can leach into the surrounding groundwater and soil uh, of disposal sites when these batteries are landfilled rather than being properly recycled. So ultimately, Lifecycle sees the need uh, to work in hand in hand with incumbent auto recyclers to help mitigate these risks as increasing quantities of these electric vehicles are reaching end of life today and into the future. So to close it off, there's one question that we commonly get asked, which is about the reuse market for EV batteries specifically. There's earlier uh, in say 2015 to 2018 timeframe, a lot of talk about the potential for reuse of these batteries in electric, or sorry, in energy storage applications. Um, and so Lifecycle ultimately sees that as being, while that's an exciting possibility and something that there's a lot of companies doing interesting work on about how we can sort of repurpose and remanufacture these batteries to get the, that extra life out of them once they're not suitable for transportation applications, but still perfectly usable in an energy storage uh, sector. We don't want that to sort of take away from the fact that ultimately that's not a solution. That's rather just sort of kicking the problem five, maybe five to 10 years down the road. Uh, but ultimately the, the important thing is going to be developing the technology for how we can extract those battery materials out of these batteries whenever it is that they do come off the market, even if that is that further down the line. Um, and so ultimately the reuse case while interesting is not a solution and it's not a reason to decrease the urgency with which we need to be building out this technology globally to handle uh, the incoming wave of batteries that are coming off the market in the near term future. So with that, I'll conclude my part. I'll hand it over to Alan to talk more about closing the loop with respect to consumer electronic batteries. Thanks, Stefan. Yeah, so just like with the EV segment, there are a number of unique challenges with respect to recycling lithium ion batteries from a CE perspective. The first challenge we're going to talk about today is the loss of lithium ion batteries in local markets due to reuse. The second is the impact of smaller and lighter consumer electronic products. Thirdly, we'll talk about the challenges with identifying these days what products actually do contain lithium ion batteries. The fourth challenge is damaged, defective, and recalled, or otherwise known as DDR, lithium ion batteries. And finally, we'll look at lithium ion batteries entering the general waste stream as opposed to the proper recycling stream. So this diagram shows a very simplified uh, chain in terms of what happens with electronic products when they come to their end of life. So on the left-hand side of this uh, diagram, we can see a laptop, a tablet, a cell phone, and they would go back to uh, potentially the manufacturer, a telecom carrier, a retailer, a charity, a municipal transfer station. And of course, there's many other options here as well, but this is where the electronic products typically go first. Most of these organizations are focused on collection. They're not really processing the material as well. So most of them partner with either a refurbisher or a recycler or somebody who acts as both and the materials move to the right. If an asset came out of a corporation and it tends to be, let's say three years old, it will be refurbished locally and go back into the local economy. It may have come from a large corporation 
and end up with an SME or a small and medium sized enterprise, maybe a school board, maybe to a consumer, but it will stay local. However, when that asset comes back the second time, it's now potentially seven years old and the market demand for that in the local market uh, may no longer exist. However, there's still very much of a demand for that same product in an emerging market and the resale value in that emerging market is higher than the resource recovery value in the local market. So these products leave the local market. Now at the same time, it may be that certain lithium ion batteries were extracted from this material and they move to uh, battery consolidators. The battery consolidators will do the same thing. They'll realize that a battery that may only hold 30, 40% of its charge isn't something that people want in the local market, but there's a reuse market in other markets for that. So again, those batteries leave the market. So by the time the batteries end up at the lithium ion recycler for resource recovery at the end, there's a significant number of consumer electronics batteries that have left the market. And that has an impact on business cases. And it also has an impact on the government's goals for local circular economies. And again, we're not trying to say anything negative about reuse, but one does need to be aware that just because the batteries were used in one market doesn't mean they're always going to be recycled in the same market. The second challenge is that electronics are smaller and lighter. And even sometimes more importantly, they're more likely to incorporate a glued in lithium ion battery or an epoxied lithium ion battery. And so these factors have, these factors increase the labor required to process electronic products because if you want to generate a ton of material, you have to physically handle many, many more products. So the labor cost to do this dismantling significantly increases along with the risk because as these smaller products have these epoxy batteries, there's more risk involved with removing them from the products. There's traditionally three options to manage this that people look at. The first is automation. The second is offshoring the dismantling to low cost jurisdictions. And finally, recycling the entire product containing the lithium ion battery all at once. And we'll look at these uh, challenges a little bit more on the following slide. So first on the left-hand side, automated dismantling. This works well when you have a single stream of material where typically an OEM can control the take back of their own material. It doesn't work well when you have mixed streams of material, multiple manufacturers, multiple product lines, and multiple product numbers. And the classic example of this that many of us are familiar with is Apple's Daisy robot for cell phone dismantling. The second scenario, low cost manual demanufacturing in the middle. Again, this works well when you have a similar product set because the operators have a common tool set. When every time a new product comes along, you have to look at it and then decide what tool set you require. It really takes away the efficiency from this. And again, the other challenge with this, going back to uh, the previous slide is that this is again, a loss of local resources in the local market. Thirdly, uh, the, the goal was to potentially recycle whole products containing lithium ion batteries. And future lithium ion battery recycling is looking to move towards a 100% hydrometallurgical approach to increase the recovery rate, reduce cost, and reduce the environmental impacts. But there are challenges with trying to do that and also handle a wide variety of products on the input side. And we'll look at that in more detail on the next slide. So this shows the, um, the simplified view of what happens at our recycling facility. And for those of you who saw the word spoken hub on the introduction, maybe didn't understand them, this slide should help explain that as well. So on the left-hand side, we have batteries going into the process. Those batteries can be at any state of charge and they could have any cathode chemistry. They go into the spoke, which is safe size reduction, there are materials recovered right after the spoke. They tend to be from the casings, such as plastics and ferrous, and they're from the foils for the cathode and the anode, the copper and the aluminum. But the material that has been deposited on the cathode and the aluminum, the battery grade materials, 
move forward as what we call black mass into the hub. There, reagents are added into the process and all the items at the right-hand side are recovered from the process. And this is what we talk about when we say we want to maximize the resource recovery. Today's solutions may only be recovering two of these eight items on the right-hand side of the slide. However, if we start looking at the right-hand slide and moving back, the only way we can recover all these resources, all eight of them, is to really control what goes into the hub. And the only way to control what goes into the hub is to control what goes into the spoke. And so if we start adding whole products with many, many materials and chemicals that we don't know what they're going to be, that adds complication and can cause contamination through the process. Moving on to challenge three, identifying what products contain lithium ion batteries. Everything shown on this slide contains a lithium ion battery. However, there are many similar looking products that might contain a different type of battery, maybe a nickel cadmium, maybe a lithium primary, and maybe some products that look like this don't contain any battery at all. So this has a number of significant cost implications for the electronics recycler at the recycling facilities. Firstly, it increases the training costs to have the operators know what has a lithium ion battery and how to look for lithium ion batteries. The conveyors must be slowed down because more time must be spent looking at these products in more detail. Additional labor required to remove the lithium batteries from products that were sometimes never designed to be opened up in the first place. There's additional capital costs for thermal detectors and fire suppression systems on conveyor lines and storage areas, and rents are increasing, insurance rates are increasing. So the net net of it is that for electronics recyclers, these lithium ion batteries are increasing the overall cost at the back end of the system. Okay, moving to challenge number four, DDR batteries. DDR batteries are those that pose additional risks and have special regulations for handling, packing, and labeling. In this case, DDR does not apply to a battery that may have had a clipped wire or a clipped connector, and now it's damaged from the point of being reused. That's not what we mean by DDR in this case. Here, there's additional risks. The good news is that if the regulations are followed, there really should be no issues with the collection, transportation, or processing of these batteries. There are many battery collection programs that can be found with a quick Google search that provide the containers, materials, packing materials, labels, everything required for the safe return of small quantities of these batteries. And the larger recyclers know how to manage this material when it's properly identified as well. The challenge is when these DDR batteries enter the standard stream for reuse and recycling. And the reason why that does happen is it does cost more money to manage these these products uh, properly. So sometimes people have an incentive to add them in with the regular stream and that's where the challenge arises. And the final challenge, lithium ion batteries in the general waste stream. Unfortunately, electronic products and especially those with lithium ion batteries don't always go through the proper recycling channel. They often end up in the waste stream. And waste audits have traditionally shown two realities regarding this. One is that the smaller the item, the more likely it is to end up in the general waste stream. And secondly, condos and apartment buildings often are the main culprit where small electronics can easily be entered into the waste stream by simply putting them down the chute. The example shown on the poster on the left-hand side of the slide. And here's what happens when you put that down the chute or any other way it could end up in the general waste stream. Maybe you have a curbside pickup program, but the truck that comes by has a compactor built in. Maybe you do live in a condo or an apartment. There's a compactor in the bottom in the basement of the building. And when material ends up at a materials recycling facility, there's fast high moving automated sorting systems that are bouncing material from one conveyor to another. And all these factors result in facility fires. So to summarize, we have our five considerations, local recovery, maximizing the recycling rate, the, minimizing the environmental impacts, minimizing the safety risk, and doing it all cost effectively. 
we can see that both segments have their challenges. The challenges are different, but both segments do have their challenges. Uh, to summarize this slide down a little bit more, it's safe to say that the key challenges for the EV segment are related to safety and cost. And the key challenges for the consumer electronics segment are related to the loss of local resources and also the safety issues and cost. So cost and safety are a, a, a large issue in both segments. Okay, just to conclude. So some key industry trends. We are convinced that there's going to be continued market growth with an incoming tsunami of end of life batteries. Although this is a global market, it's also a regional market. There's going to be many, many local and regional issues and regulations and dynamics that need to be considered. But at the end of the day, we believe there's an opportunity because it's an underserved market. The traditional incumbents infrastructure was really based on the mining industry and was optimized to recover one or two materials, not trying to recover eight materials from the same BIM put at the same time. And to summarize with why life cycle, we have proven technology, we can recover 95% of the battery grade materials from all types of lithium ion batteries. We're investing now to prepare ourselves for the growing market. We have a robust pipeline, we'll offer secured access for our battery customers for virgin grade equivalent materials. We're commercial today, both in terms of our capacity and in terms of our customers and access to material. We will have the lowest cost, we'll be the most secure, and we will offer the most sustainably sourced supply of critical materials. And finally, we have an experienced team across many disciplines so that we can execute and deliver. And with that, I'll pass things back to Canal for the Q&A session. Great, thanks, Alan. Thanks, Stefan. A uh, lot of uh, questions coming up that I, I was also trying to answer in parallel as, as we go along here. Um, maybe just to, I left some here uh, that we can answer live. Uh, I'll just read it off. Question from Mark is, will the processing hubs focus on end customers in North America for receiving use batteries or are these hubs intended to receive products from other global regions? I think maybe just to clarify some of the terminology, uh, our spokes are, are where we receive batteries. So uh, as uh, I think Alan and Stefan explained, we have two operational now in North America with plans to deploy spokes uh, globally. And, and that's where batteries and battery materials like cathode scrap and the like are received. And the hub is actually a uh, taking only black mass or recovered materials either from uh, the spoke or, or other uh, sources of black mass into the facility for further refining. Uh, maybe the next question from another Mark here is, even in a hub and spoke system, you have to encase some of the more hazardous batteries for transport. How do you lower that cost? Stefan, maybe you want to highlight how we've dealt with, you know, damaged EV batteries and, and, uh, and the like. Yeah, uh, with the high voltage sector, they are, they're packed in these specialty aluminum metal uh, sort of boxes that are fit to the side, like the size of the physical battery, and then the batteries placed inside, filled with vermiculite, and then transported as such. One of the ways that we've seen automotive OEMs trying to minimize the cost of sort of dealing with DDR high voltage batteries is by having a certain number of those boxes in circulation throughout uh, the country or the region that they're servicing. So you're minimizing the, like, I guess the upfront capital that's required to purchase these boxes, given that they're pretty expensive, but then working hand in hand with the life cycle to have them in circulation at all times. So one's received at our facility containing a battery, it's immediately extracted, uh, dismantled and processed given it, its priority placement as a damaged battery. And then that box is shipped out as fast as possible uh, to the next dealership or the next location in which it's needed. And so by keeping a sort of a high rate of circulation of those boxes, you minimize the number that you need and in doing so decrease the cost as much as possible. Yeah, and I think that's the cost on the packaging side. I mean, uh, you know, we've come up with a spoken hub idea and concept and as we roll out more spokes and other 
groups start to roll out their production facilities. I mean, I think the scale of us and and our our colleagues will help to to bring facilities closer to where those damaged batteries are to to help lower the cost. Yeah. Uh, next question was, what is the purity of recovered metals? I'll just handle this quickly. I mean, the cobalt, nickel, lithium, we produce at 99.5% purity plus. Obviously, the target there is with the battery grade material. So we're working closely with potential customers in an iterative process to get it to their, um, their quality standards. Next question, do we have hazardous waste at the end of the recovery? Uh, I mean, at the end of the spoke process, uh, we have basically black mass mixed metals and plastics, none of which are, are hazardous waste in the jurisdictions in which we operate. And then as we refine the black mass through the hub, again, we're producing, uh, or producing all products out of that that are all uh, not considered hazardous waste. Uh, and I think the next question from Andrew back is, can you speak to R and D and how that affects the capability to execute? Uh, I mean, I'm not hundred percent clear on, on the question here, but I think uh, R and D is a continuous process here, you know, in the early stages of life cycle uh, and, and Andrew uh, is present in Kingston there uh, where we have our basically center of excellence. Um, we went through several stages R and D to get to the, the commercial stage of our spoke and now commercialization of the hub continue to prove out different processes. But I think in the long run, R and D is going to continue to operate. I mean, how do we deal with the next issues, next types of batteries, next generation of batteries um, and uh, continue to advance our, our company. So uh, it goes hand in hand with our execution and deployment of commercial facilities and continuing to look at the, the next thing. Uh, what percent of forecasted global market can Lifecycle serve? I mean, uh, the global market outside of North America and, and when you look in countries in Asia, there's, there's a lot more batteries already. Um, our hope is to continue to deploy both, as I think Alan said, spokes in, in other regions, but also uh, once we've had our learnings from deploying our first hub, um, to, to deploy that in, in other markets to continue to increase our, our market share. Of course, there's going to be other players in the market, but there's, is, there's enough for everyone uh, to, to have a share. We don't have a specific number we share externally on, on what our, our target there is. Last question of right now is how will decreasing CO and or cobalt and new NMC impact economic viability? Of course, we see that is, is the case, especially in the EV side, uh, you know, geared towards higher nickel. Uh, and uh, we've accounted for that in our, our business model. But I think as Alan was talking about being able to have multiple revenue streams, not just from nickel cobalt, but lithium, manganese, graphite helps us to uh, accommodate that. And, and uh, you know, we've accounted for the long run uh, having a lot more nickel production than cobalt production from our facility. And Kunal, maybe I'll jump in there because it is worth noting that yes, the cobalt per battery in NMC is decreasing and has been following a trend of decreasing from like 111 original down to what's almost standard as 822 or 811 at this point. Uh, but the volume of cobalt that's still going to be entering the market via NMC battery cells, that is going to be increasing dramatically. And so, yeah, the, the unit recoverable cobalt per battery will be diminished um, as they drive towards a more cost-effective battery chemistry, uh, but that will be in a way offset by the uh, growth in terms of total market volume of NMC that's entered the market based on those projections that were shared on the slides at the beginning. Yeah. Thanks, Stefan. Um, all right. More questions uh, coming in. Uh, one is, is there any discharging before first mechanical treatment of lithium ion batteries? Alan, maybe you want to cover that? I can always jump in after too. Yeah, with our system, we can take uh, batteries at any state of charge. And in addition to that, with any cathode. So we do not require any discharging uh, at our facilities to handle the batteries. 
Great. And the next question, where are spokes located today? Where will you expand next? Um, so we have a Kingston, Ontario plant, 5,000 tons per year, Rochester, New York, 5,000 tons per year. And I think it was in Alan's slide uh, showing that we're looking right at the beginning. We said we're, we're looking at a, a location in Nevada or potential other locations around there, but uh, most likely Nevada is going to be where our next spoke is located. Uh, let's just go back to that. Would you license or franchise your model? Right now, our approach in other jurisdictions really through joint venture. Um, our, our technology is such that we want to be involved in, in the operation and, and have access to the output material. Um, and in that context, we're, we're not looking to purely license the technology. Can you discuss why you focus on producing elemental products as opposed to so-called direct recycling? Uh, you know, our approach has been that from the battery supply side, as you heard from Alan and, and Stefan, you know, there's, there's a high variety of material coming in. Uh, and, you know, when we produce elemental products, we can cater to what's the new material being produced. So right now we might see a lot of NMC 111 because that's what's maybe out in the market. But the majority of the fat manufacturers have already moved to say an NMC six two two. So, if we're we're doing a direct recycling, you would need to to modify that process to cater to what's being produced now versus what was produced years ago. And and to have that ultimate flexibility, uh, we've chosen the approach of going to the elemental products. Uh, and what that also enables us to do is look at other opportunities for the materials. Example, lithium is used in glass and ceramics. So it doesn't limit us to, to only battery off takers. Uh, there's a question here, Stefan. Can you please explain the CO2 footprint differences between primary and secondary materials? I don't know if you want to go back to that slide and just yeah. comment on what on the LCA we did. This so this slide is not the LCA slide. This is the purely primary production of these materials we'd have a separate slide that shows the difference, but essentially uh, it, it is more CO2 intensive to produce these materials when they're uh, taken from like the actual primary sources uh, and mined and then refined for first use within the, well, for whatever use uh, that they're put toward. Whereas via life cycles process specifically, that's what we'd have actual data on. Um, we can produce the same materials at the same battery grade uh, required for use in production at a significantly reduced CO2 footprint. Um, with cobalt, for example, there's uh, without this, the number would be more, more aggressive than this, but it'd be something around the lines of a 75% reduction in total CO2 footprint of cobalt sulfate production through recycling as opposed to primary production. And similarly, aggressive numbers across all three of these. Um, and so ultimately in the long run, as production of these materials through secondary sources becomes a higher and higher uh, volume of the supply chain, we're going to see that the sort of sustainability or green argument for electric vehicles or for whatever uh, application these batteries are being produced for will be strengthened uh, by way of decreasing the upfront CO2 footprint. And so we, we separately conducted a life cycle analysis of our process footprint uh, that we're using for reference. Uh, it would vary depending on the actual processing technology used, but we can confirm that with life cycle technology, we can produce each of these materials at a significantly reduced uh, CO2 footprint. Great. And uh, I think there's a related question here, Stefan, what is the CO2 footprint of your process and how much of that energy you're using in the process is renewable? So I think Stefan, the, the LCA he was discussing was done based on our Kingston facility. Yep. Um, we've compared that CO2 footprint directly with primary resources and then used, for example, the Ontario energy mix for that. Obviously, depending on the jurisdiction we're in, uh, we'll have different uh, CO2 footprints. But uh, I mean, the spoke side, there there really isn't a whole lot of energy usage. It's, uh, it's a fairly electricity uh, light. Yep. And I'll just make a quick note. Whoever is asking this question, by all means, reach out to either Alan or myself at the contact info here. And then we can provide a little bit more detail about that analysis since we don't have the slide included here, but reach out and happy to discuss more. 
Uh, okay, uh, I think we still have some time here, and there's still a few questions. Uh, are you able to produce battery grade graphite? Uh, you know, from the beginning, we've seen that and understand that as a battery operates, there's some changes to the graphite from a morphology perspective. So our target has been to use graphite in other applications as it comes out of the process. Uh, however, we are looking, uh, you know, at some early stage R&D partners that are, are able to potentially put this back into to batteries. So uh, stay tuned and hopefully there is a possible pathway in the long run for that. Uh, I can go to the next question. Can you discuss how you're deciding where to locate your spoken hub and do you look at population of EVs uh, or other partnerships? Stefan, you want to take that one as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, on an, I'll just talk about it from a North American perspective. Uh, the first boat being built out in Kingston was related to our existing operations and expertise that was developed over the course of our pilot scale up. Uh, so that was the thinking with that. And then yes, um, our second and third commercial spokes in North America will be, uh, one is currently located in Rochester and the other one being located in Nevada, proximal to California and that serving that sort of Southwestern region where there is, or where we're seeing the highest rates of EV penetration uh, to date. And so, yes, the idea is to be regionally deployed proximal to uh, sort of the concentrations of end of life batteries that are coming off the market. So, so as to decrease the transportation cost and make it more efficient uh, to get these batteries from customers to our facility. And then likewise, replicating that across the globe in uh, Europe and Asia as we roll out technology over the next five to 10 years. Great, thanks, Stefan. Uh, we also have a question here. How would we handle waste lithium ion batteries if there's no lithium ion battery recycling technology? Alan, maybe from your experience in electronic waste, you could talk about uh, other pathways, at least in the small form of batteries for the, the small, uh, for the Yeah, I guess waste. it really depends on the, on the cathode type because again, if it's an electronic battery using the LCO cathode, there's so much cobalt in it that one way or the other, people will find uh, a solution to recycle that. And, and so if there wasn't any lithium ion battery cycle, people would find it, even if it just melt, meant they were taking batteries and smelting them, that would likely still end up being the solution. It, it is a challenge when you get to the other uh, cathode batteries where the economics aren't as attractive. And, and we do see situations today where people are stockpiling lithium ion batteries just due to the cost. So that's why we talk about this challenge. And as we roll out more infrastructure and we're able to recover more materials at the back end, we will be able to bring those costs down and reduce, um, reduce those issues that uh, cause there in some cases not to be the solution that people are looking for. Yep, thanks, Alan. Uh, there's also a question, sourcing of EV batteries seems to be key to ensure efficient and profitable operations. With whom do you work, waste management? or directly with car dealers? Uh, I mean, we're not gonna mention names, but maybe both of you can answer, Stefan, maybe on the EV side, you know, what we see in terms of where you know, core EV batteries come from. And then also there's some other avenues. And then Alan, maybe you also wanna just comment where the different sort of verticals where we can get consumer batteries. Yeah, so at the moment, the majority of the electric vehicle batteries that we recycle are coming directly from dealerships and service centers. Um, but with that being said, Lifecycle is happy to work with any industry player who has batteries on hand. So we're, like, we're flexible. It's just that that's where we're seeing the majority of the volume coming from right now. And that's why in my segment, I was highlighting the need to sort of, or the, the coming need to deal with what, what we, or how we obtain these batteries once they're being uh, or coming off the market outside of the manufacturer scope. So once they're not just able to be returned to the dealership, if that's off the table when you're dealing with battery or cars that have been on the road for 10, 15 years, and instead they're going to scrap recyclers, there's going to be um, an increased volume that are coming from these, these sort of in industry incumbents that have historically not had to deal with electric vehicle batteries. And so we expect to see that volume increasing in the future, but for now it's mostly coming from the dealerships themselves on the high voltage side. Yeah, and on the consumer side, we, we tend to break consumer down into two streams. There's the 
high LCO or high cobalt content batteries that come from laptops, cell phone, tablets, material like that. And then there's also the drill packs that, and, and that's material as well, which may actually be NCM and not contain as much cobalt. So on the, on the first side, most of that material would come through the electronic recyclers and the re electronic refurbishers. Once they've gone through the material and decided what they cannot reuse, there would be a fallout that would come to us. And with respect to the uh, drill pack side of it, that tends to be to go through different consumer collection programs that exist in many states and in many provinces where there's collection depots in government buildings, at retailers, et cetera. Thanks, Alan. Uh, we also have a question. Would you be in favor of a barcode equivalent on each battery given its metal composition? Um, you know, I think that's a, a very interesting concept. I think it's very helpful uh, over the long run because we do see a mixed load of batteries where, we, you know, if we're dealing with the automotive or commercial vehicle manufacturer, that it's usually a little bit more obvious because, you know, a certain model always has the same chemistry, but, um, I think, Alan, maybe you want to comment on, on the sort of portable electronics. I mean, we see mixed barrels of batteries and having this barcode would be, be interesting. I think, Alan, you're still- I was on, mute. Oh, I was on yep. mute, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And I'm also thinking about the barcode is potentially, if, if something similar could be done to even identify that this product has a lithium ion battery inside, that would be just as interesting to help with the third challenge that we look at as well. Yeah, uh, for sure. And uh, last, maybe we only have a couple minutes here. There's a question, who's handling the transport of EV batteries from the car dealers currently? Stefan, maybe you wanna touch upon yeah. that? It, it definitely depends, but most of it on our end is being coordinated by Lifecycle. So we'll, upon request from a dealership or a company, uh, coordinate the pickup once the battery is prepared and packaged and then have it shipped to our facility. And then likewise, as we were talking about earlier with those uh, damaged battery containers, similarly, we'll coordinate the shipment of those to uh, different facilities and dealerships as needed. We're flexible, so we're happy to work with the preference of the customer, whether they want to do it themselves if they have preferred carriers, but Lifecycle is happy to coordinate that. Great. Uh, I think we just have a couple minutes here. Uh, I think there's a lot of good questions came and we thank the audience for attending and, and, uh, and their interest um, and, and many people staying right till the, the final minutes here. I want to thank Stefan and Alan from my team. Uh, as we said, we're, we're going to circulate the slides uh, and within the slides, you'll see Stefan and Alan's contact information. If there are some uh, follow-up questions that we didn't get to, happy to answer them offline. You can also email us at info at uh, So once again, thanks everyone for taking time out of their day to attend our webinar. We, uh, we're looking forward to continuing this series of webinars in 2021 uh, so that we can uh, continue to uh, you know, show that there's, there's a solution here for lithium ion batteries and, and help this industry grow. So thanks everyone and uh, have a wonderful day.